Democratic Party candidate Joe Biden has officially been declared the winner of the U.S. 2020 presidential elections. Let's examine how Donald Trump will attempt to refute these results, what a Biden-Harris presidency might look like, and how divided the United States currently stands. I'm Richard Medhurst, and you're watching The Communique. It's been several days now since Americans have finished casting their ballots in the 2020 presidential elections. Voter turnout has been absolutely record-breaking, with numbers surpassing those of 2016 and set to be the highest in modern American history, according to the latest projections. After election results were dragged out over several days with no clear winner in sight, finally, four days after the polls closed, all the major networks finally called the presidential race in Joe Biden's favor. He won the state of Pennsylvania, which got him over the 270 electoral votes needed to secure the presidency. Vice President-elect Kamala Harris was also seen phoning Joe Biden to tell him that they had won the presidency and the race to the White House. We did it. We did it, Joe. You're going to be the next president of the United States. <laughs> After securing the win, President-elect Joe Biden then went out to address his supporters. The people of this nation have spoken. They've delivered us a clear victory, a convincing victory. I pledge to be a president who seeks not to divide, but unify. Several foreign leaders and dignitaries also went on to congratulate Joe Biden on his win, including British Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, and former Vice President Barack Obama. On the night of the election, Donald Trump went on a series of tirades on his Twitter claiming that he had won the election, that the election was being stolen from him. He then went out to give a short speech, again, declaring himself the winner. For the good of this nation, this is a very big moment. This is a major fraud in our nation. We want the law to be used in a proper manner. So we'll be going to the U.S. Supreme Court. We want all voting to stop. We will win this. And we, as far as I'm concerned, we already have won it. So I just want to thank... Now, even after the news that Joe Biden has won Pennsylvania and has gotten over 270 electoral votes, he still refuses to concede and insists that he has won the election. The Trump campaign actually went on to file several lawsuits in these battleground states, including Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Michigan. Now, whether Donald Trump is able to alter the results of this election in any substantial way through these lawsuits is yet to be seen. States have a safe harbor period of 35 days for them to all individually report their results to Congress before December 8th. The United States is currently very divided. In these last battleground states, the margins between Trump and Biden were razor thin, hence why it took so long to actually count all the ballots. Moreover, Trump supporters have been protesting in some states for votes to stop being counted. In other states, they've been protesting for votes to continue to be counted. Many of them echoing this claim, repeating what Donald Trump said, that the election is being stolen from him. I'm joined by Dr. Marendi, who is a professor at the University of Tehran. Hi, professor. Thank you for taking the time. Hi, Richard. Thank you for having me. Professor, what are your initial thoughts on the election results and president-elect Joe Biden? Well, it depends on how we look at it. Uh, the, the whole election process is extraordinary. And the way in which the media is shutting down Trump and his supporters is unprecedented. And if it was any other country other than the United States or, or other than some Western European country allied to the United States, there would be outrage. So I'm just wondering how far I can go right now in, discuss, in, in discussing this with you even on, on your show. So that is one important element 
regardless of whether there was fraud or not and uh, how much fraud there was, the very fact that um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook are shutting down dissent is sort of cheating in itself. I mean, they've been doing it before the election and afterwards. And of course, Trump himself using um, uh, the federal mail service and trying to slow down the process of um, you know ballots coming in through mail, that itself is a form of cheating. But the accusations that are now being made, although we're not hearing it even on Fox News, we have to see. We have to see how true they are, how extensive they are. But the very fact that they're, even Fox News has distanced itself from Trump is saying a lot about the nature of the, shall we call it the deep state. But in any case, with regards to Biden himself, Biden is very similar to Trump. The, the, when, when we look at our region, Biden supported the Iraq war. Biden was alongside Obama when the Saudis were allowed to destroy Yemen and the Americans gave the green light. Biden was the vice president when Libya was destroyed. And of course, the dirty war in Syria was led by the United States, of course, you know, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, who are now yes. at odds with each other, but back then, along with the Israelis and others who were working together to support the extremists in Syria. So Biden is not exactly the benign, uh, friendly old grandfather that he's depicted to be by some. Forget the fact that you know he was closely affiliated to big business, the credit card companies, and of course, um, the accusations made against him with regards to uh, a young woman staffer of his years ago makes him quite similar to Trump in many ways. So the difference between Biden and Trump is not very great. The only difference is that Trump is more ugly in his language and behavior, but Byron is, he seems to have dementia. Professor, I just want to rewind the clocks back a second. Uh, in 2009, in the elections in Iran, we also heard the uh, opposition putting forward allegations of fraud. And right now we see uh, Donald Trump claiming that the election was stolen from him. Uh, social media actually played a big role in that. They, they actually helped uh, anti-establishment voices during this uh, so-called Twitter revolution in 2009 in Iran. And yet now with, with Trump, they seem to be uh, playing against him and, and silencing him. What do you make of that? Well, I see something quite different, actually, because in 2009... The U.S. government asked Twitter to not to shut down because Twitter wanted right. to shut down and repairs. And they said, no, please keep going. We need you to help undermine Iran. Exactly. Yet yeah. now, when the elections are much closer in the United States, I mean, in Iran, it was a landslide. There was no fraud in 2009, regardless of whether you one likes the, the, the president who won or the uh, his challengers who lost, but uh, in the United States, the election outcome was extremely close, yet the shutting down of all dissent, including on Twitter, is extraordinary. So it's the exact opposite. In the case of Iran, the uh, Twitter and other outlets were used to try to undermine uh, the country, but in the United States, they're being used to prevent dissent from creating any form of right. um, protest movement. Because we, we saw how Twitter, they censored this New York Post article that was damaging to uh, Joe Biden's son. And then they also censored a bunch of uh, tweets by Donald Trump. Well, I think it's becoming extremely complicated, especially now with artificial intelligence and how these tech companies are becoming more powerful and the borderline between these techno tech companies and the state are increasingly becoming blurry. So on the one hand, they can be used to undermine states, countries that are independent of the United States, but in the United States, they're being used 
to shut down dissent. And it's becoming, in my opinion, quite clear that these companies are deeply in bed with the deep state. But in the past, we used to view them as tools of the US or the, the state against adversaries outside of the United States. But now it's moved to adversaries inside the United States. And I find that, I find that actually extremely stunning. And I find it extraordinary that liberals and many, many progressives are at the moment indifferent about this, but I think right. many are going to pay a price, a heavy price uh, for their silence or for their acceptance of this. But in addition to that, what I find uh, amazing is that even you know, outlets such as Fox News, they are not, they are, they are sort of standing back now. So it sort of shows the, the extraordinary strength of the centers of power uh, in in the United States, it's uh, it. Uh, I, I I'm quite fascinating how well coordinated things seem to be. I don't believe in conspiracy theories and all that, but I think this this ideological overlap, or the you know the the interests of all these centers of power, converge in a way in which they just think that they have to, you know, accept this and and move on. And I th- but I think that in future, it's going to make the United States a more uh, authoritarian state at home. And I, I don't think that w- this is the end of the story. I think you're going, we're going to see instability in the United States. I despise Trump, obviously, as do you, and I'm sure most of, our, most of your viewers. But the person who's come in his place is no better. But more importantly is how this is playing out it's a right. this is the dissent is being uh silenced in the united states and this doesn't seem to be a story so do you think that under a uh, biden harris administration the authoritarian strain that we find among uh, neoliberals is going to manifest itself even more that there will be even more uh, repression of dissent and, and more censorship for people who try to criticize uh, Biden? Well, Richard, the liberals destroyed Libya in the name of the right to protect. They supported Wahhabi extremists that destroyed much of Syria. You and I both know Syria pretty well. They've demolished Syria, and they are proud of yes. what they've done. They, their allies are Saudi Arabia. Their allies are an apartheid state in, you know, in, in, in Palestine. Uh, they are willing to strangle Venezuela. They never complained. They never were outraged by the murder of General Soleimani or the siege on Iran, trying to starve Iranians of food and medicine. You know, their complaints have not been about Iran or Venezuela or Cuba or the coup exactly. in Bolivia or any of these or, or their own actions. Their criticisms are of Trump, his bombastic language, and uh, some of his appointees in the Supreme Court. But when millions of lives are destroyed and countries demolished, these liberals have been fine with it. So. They, are all, they have already been authoritarian abroad. Why can't they be authoritarian at home? What do you think a Biden presidency is going to look like uh, towards the Middle East and specifically towards Iran? Do you see much changing at all? No, I think there is continuity in U.S. foreign policy. And uh, we have seen this continuity from one administration to another. This maximum pressure campaign of Trump's was actually began under Obama, right. and of course Biden was his vice president, and it was only eased after the nuclear deal, but even after the nuclear deal, the Americans under Obama never abided by the deal, whereas the Iranians did. The dirty war, for example, the murder of General Soleimani by uh, Trump is you know, outrageous, but the dirty war in Syria began with Obama. And so all these innocent people who were defending Syria against the extremists, they were 
General Soleimani is, you know, in their own right, each and every one of them. So I don't see any difference. There will be a difference in tactic. And the United States is much weaker today after this election. It's soft power, you know, demolished because we're seeing how it's conducting itself. And its regional allies are weakened across the board. Right. So the United States is a, dimi a diminished power compared to what it was before. I'm not saying it is no longer a power. But it is going to be much more difficult for it to maintain its hegemony as time goes by. And I think this was a, an important footnote in that process. I don't see a great future for Saudi Arabia. I think Erdogan is going to have many problems. I think the Emirates is in facing difficulty. All these allies in this region, and Europe is in trouble. The world is, is changing fast, Richard. I think it's, we're moving towards not a new global order. I think we're moving towards greater chaos and disorder, right. which is a good thing and a bad thing because the old order was very bad. So it's good to, you know, be freed of that. But disorder, it's not necessarily a good thing either. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining me, Professor. I really appreciate your time. Stay with us. We'll be right back with the program after this short break. The arms embargo on Iran came to an end, and the U.S. seems to have gotten itself a new president. So might the sanction lifting hold? Will the rule of law now prevail? To hear experts on the matter, watch Iran today. Joining me from Chicago is Kit Cabello, reporter from Hard Lens Media, to tell us more about the situation on the ground. Can you tell us a bit more about the social unrest that's going on? Because uh, obviously the, the oligarchs and the ruling elites, Wall Street, they're unfazed by the result of the election, but there's a lot of social unrest. So could you tell us a bit more how the situation is on the ground? Well, uh, the protests aren't gonna go away. Uh, but will they be covered as much? Uh, because again, with Trump, it's easy for the media to spin certain things because he's somebody who doesn't know how to shut his own mouth and he always thinks that he's in the right. When we look at the social unrest, just because Biden's president doesn't mean it's gonna go away. Will the media cover it as much is yet to be determined and what actions Biden and his administration will do to help out families is very important. I mentioned this before, 60 million Americans right now are on unemployment also include those that are underemployed or no longer recognized by the unemployment system. So maybe we're looking at 70 or 80 million. It's not fair to say those numbers, but the current numbers are at 60 million. Right. 30 to 40 million Americans are at risk of being evicted from their homes. You have an economic crisis as well. You also have the fact that we're still dealing with this virus and there's no Medicare for all. This is a perfect storm that's brewing, plus the ever-growing threat of climate change. There will be social unrest. And if no action is taken, it will get worse. And just because it's a Democrat in office doesn't mean people will be polite. I think it's very difficult right now for American families to look and to, to sit down at the table and make a decision. Well, what bills do I have to pay? Do I have to go a day or two without feeding myself because I don't want my kid to starve? Do, do I pay the electric bill or the heating bill? Do I put gas in my car or do I take the bus? These are real questions Americans are asking themselves. We don't have universal basic income. We don't have Medicare for all. A lot of Americans my age and younger are struggling with 50 to 100 to 200 to, dare I say, maybe even a million dollars of student debt yes. because we don't have affordable college. This is a boiling pot, and it's going to explode. And just because Trump or Biden, whoever sits in office, the problem isn't going to go away, but the establishment thinks that maybe if they – do certain rules here or there, they pass certain policies here and there, everything, everyone will behave themselves. What we're seeing, thanks to everything that we saw was COVID, the neoliberal lies th that we've been shown or presented to, to, American, to Americans for years, it, it, it's a lie, it doesn't hold up. Nothing is working and the system is failing. So what's, what we can see is eventually more protests, but I think we'll see the activists, community organizers, the protests die down just for a little bit because everyone's going to go to brunch <laughs> because the orange yeah. Trump bad guy <laughs> is gone. Exactly. But just because he's gone doesn't mean that the problem 
is gone as well because a system that made Trump is still here. It's just got the friendly old man face of Biden with his good sidekick, Kamala Harris. They don't care. These politicians could have done something years ago, right. but they chose not to. It's give it time. There's going to be a breaking point again where Americans are going to be upset. Yeah. And, and, and then all these people who were these vote blue no matter who, you're, they're going to have to make a serious decision of, do we still keep this thing going on? Because something worse can follow after Biden. We, after, after Obama, we got Trump. What does that say also about the House and Senate races? Because Mitch McConnell has said that even, even if Biden wins the presidency, he's going to wreak havoc and, and essentially uh, block him from just putting in whoever he wants. So what, what do you make of this situation in terms of having a Biden presidency with a Republican GOP Senate for the next four years or uh, for the foreseeable future, at least? Um, we're dealing with a divided house again. And what's going to change? Nothing. It's just going to be div division, division, division. And all the while when Americans are asking, hey, what are you going to do? A response from the Biden administration is the Republicans won't let us do anything. The Republicans won't let us do this or that. Mm. And it's the lack of courage. And again, this is Biden, a pragmatic central neoliberal Democrat, similar to Obama. They will compromise to the Republicans and to their demands. And they won't really push back. But the average liberal voter, the blue check marks, the media pundits will say, well, there's nothing Biden can do. And McConnell, I'm not surprised with his response. That is, that's what he does. And to your viewing audience, our politicians here in the United States don't care about us. Yeah, there's a handful here and there, but it's not enough to make a difference. And unless the American people step up and end this abuse that's happening to us, McConnell's going to play his game, the Biden administration will make excuses, and nothing will fundamentally change. Earlier, I also spoke with Craig Jardula, who's in Los Angeles and covered the Democratic primaries extensively, specifically on the issue of election integrity. Donald Trump, on the night of the election, he, he gets out there and he says that he's going to take this to, to the Supreme Court. He can't go directly to the Supreme Court, can he? How, do, how does the process work? Could you explain that to us? No, he cannot. The federal government doesn't control elections. It's controlled by the state. It's on a state-by-state -state process. And that goes through a county-by-county -county process. So he can't just go re directly to the uh, Supreme Court. I don't know what tricks he does have his sleeve. I think he was just saying that to give his uh, support, his base, some, some calmness there, thinking that they just got an elected, uh, a, a, excuse me, a Supreme Court nomination into the court, that that would be the fix, mm. but it won't. And Michigan has already said, uh, no, we're not going to get ourselves involved with any election scam right now. A judge already denied uh, you know, his lawsuit, so now he's got to go higher. A citizen of a democracy, they want to care about election integrity. They, they, they strive to have free and fair elections. And the problem is now you have Democrats accusing anyone who's questioning or scrutinizing the democratic process of being a Trump supporter. I mean, this is completely absurd. It, so they're, they've tried to chastise anyone who, who even remotely uh, raises this issue. And this was happening during the primary. Is that correct? Yep. It was happening during the primaries, too, as well. I mean, you know, nobody wanted to hear this stuff. Anytime we talked about these things, that was a right-wing talking point. Oh, that's a Putin talking point. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's either one of those two. I mean, right now, I guess it's better to be speared as a Trump supporter than it is a Russian apologist or, or Putin supporter. Uh, but yeah, it's the same tactics all and over again. They shame you, they shame you, they shame you. The thing that's interesting, Richard, is that used to be about politicians would go after each other and shame each other. Now they shame the voter. Now right. they have this whole mechanism in play. And this is the Democratic, uh, uh, Democratic establishment playbook. And they really do prey on the, uh, what I call the neo-progressives' emotions, you know what I'm saying? Where they just don't think logically, they think emotionally, they think they're doing something that's compassionate. And once again, to them, the ends justify the means. So in, in fact, today, I mean, uh, I should be wearing all black on your show because democracy is dead. And I don't see, see you seeing any help from the progressives at all on this situation. I mean, and we're all gonna be, a lot of people are gonna be politically homeless right now, even more than they already are, because there's just no way out of this. So while I'm glad to see Trump gone, I'm not so confident about what a Biden presidency, a Harris presidency means. These people have spent their entire careers pushing right-wing policies that have put workers in severe peril, that have caused wars and destruction abroad, and untold suffering. One thing is guaranteed. 
the interests of the top 1% of the oligarchy, they will be looked after, they will be taken care of. Now, whether the working class in the United States is able to mount a successful opposition against the duopoly, against the 1%, against the crooks at Wall Street, whether we see a real vigorous anti-war movement remains to be seen. I, for one, won't be holding my breath. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Richard Medhurst, and this is The Communique.